picking up where we left off, uh, this section now here in lecture four, this is going to deal with the actual war uh, of, for independence, the American Revolution. Um, there's going to be a lot of fighting. So for those of you who just don't like fighting, you don't like battles, uh, we have to cover this kind of stuff. Uh, and so I'm not going to necessarily cover all the military engagements, but I am going to cover some of the major campaigns to give you an idea of, well, why does the war shake out the way that it does? But it is more than just, uh, more than just sort of military campaigns. There's a lot that's going on uh, socially, politically, diplomatically uh, that takes place here uh, in the fighting as well. But a lot of this is going to take the form of kind of a series of military campaigns. You know, why did the Americans win? Why did the British lose? What happens uh, with all of this, all right? When we left the military situation, the Minutemen that had kind of uh, fought the British that had sort of marched inland to Lexington and Concord and kind of pushed these guys back and then shot them up pretty good uh, during their retreat now have kind of surrounded parts of, of Boston, which is the British Army's sort of base of operations. And as they're, as they're looking at these guys, uh, the, the American militia understands there's certain things they're really kind of good at, right? They're good at sort of uh, energy and excitement they're not really good at complicated military maneuvers. And so the idea of sort of attacking the British professional soldiers in an area, a, a built up urban area like Boston, where you have to get, be kind of, you can't just be an armed mob, you've got to be sort of fairly well commanded and controlled uh, and go in and sort of attack these guys in specific. They realize it was kind of beyond their capacity, at least at this point. And so what they can do is they'll blockade the city. They can dig entrenchments outside and prevent the British from attacking them, or at least attacking out back into the countryside again. But they're, they're not terribly organized uh, at this point. Now, the, the British inside Boston understand that, that time is kind of against them, that the longer they wait, the more and more of these Minutemen are going to show up, these American militia. And as, they're, as, they, as, they, as they show up, their lines around Boston get longer and longer and longer, and if they wait too long, the thinking among the British command is that eventually there will be so many of these Americans that it won't matter how disorganized they are, they'll just be able to rush us, and they'll be able to sort of wipe us all out. So the British decide to strategically attack one sort of point of the American line, and that is the Americans that are beginning to dig in on Bunker Hill, so on the Charlestown Peninsula that overlooks Boston Harbor from the north. So it's a relatively isolated part of the American line, one that they figure, well, we can attack that, and before the Americans can kind of bring in any reinforcements uh, onto the peninsula, we'll have sort of these guys uh, dominate. We'll, we'll be able to destroy these guys. Technically, it was actually Breed's Hill, the one they were on. They were supposed to be on Bunker Hill. We remember this as the Battle of Bunker Hill historically, so we can call it that. And, and if you go to this part of Boston now, it's like, there's like a Starbucks or something there. So, you know, it, it doesn't really matter uh, at this point. It's on the northern edge of the town. Well, the Americans that are up here are on uh, this, this territory. Uh, they've got themselves dug into these entrenchments, and they see the British. They're coming over uh, across the harbor in boats, and then they form up at the base uh, of the hill, and they get ready to come up. Okay, And you've got really a kind of tale of two armies uh, at this point. You get the British. They're sort of marching up the hill. They're in their, all in their uniforms. They've got their drums playing. They're all in step. Uh, they're in those, these ranks uh, of three, and they are... They're like a, a machine. These guys are, are robots, basically. You know, they're coming up the hill. They're extremely well trained. And behind these breastworks, right, you got these American militia. You've got people of different races, different nationalities. You've got different. You got no uniformity. You've got different kind of guns, uh, different types of ammunition, uh, and of course, they don't have a lot of organization. The American leadership at this point uh, understands that there is, and this is one of the great successes uh, when you look at when the American militia succeeds in the American Revolution, it, it all goes back to leadership. When they look at their militia, they say, okay, this is what they can do, and this is what they can't do, and I'm going to try to not ask them to do something that's beyond their capabilities. So I'm going to set them up in situations where they're most likely to succeed. There's a leadership lesson for those of you who don't want to study history the rest of your lives. Right? You get your subordinates in situations where they're most likely to succeed. And so one of the things that they're worried about is eventually they're going to see the British coming, they're going to fly out the hand, they're going to start shooting at them. They're going to go crazy. <laughs> They're going to come and kill me. Um, now, one of the things you've got to understand a little bit about is military technology at this point in world history. Typically, what you're going to see is, uh, uh, for the most part, these Americans are going to be armed with a 69 caliber smoothbore musket. And this type of weapon is accurate up to about 70, 75 yards. Okay? Really, most of them are only accurate up to about 60, 65 yards. So... The reason 
of that is you've got a round ball being fired out of a completely smooth barrel. So when it comes out, there's no spin on it. Those of you who play baseball know that that sounds like a knuckleball, where it doesn't, the ball doesn't spin. And for those of you who know what a knuckleball does, once it gets down range, is once it gets to a certain point, it starts doing this. And this is why knuckleball pitchers pitch it, is because once it gets right up to the batter, nobody knows where it's going to go. It's extremely hard to hit. Okay. Well, when you look at it from this point of view, it also is extremely hard to hit anything you're aiming at past a certain point. The natural inclination of a human being in this kind of situation is to flip out and just start shooting at these guys as soon as possible. But they understand they've got a limited amount of ammunition. And it takes a while, it takes about 20 to 25 seconds for a real pro to reload one of these things because you've got, you fire it and then you've got to put, uh, you've got to put powder in uh, the barrel, you've got to put the ball in, you've got to ramp it down, then you've got to put powder in the, uh, the pan, you've got to close the pan, you've got to get it up and you've got to get it ready to fire. And so it, it takes a while, it takes a while to reload one of these things. It's not like sort of modern war movies that every sort of hold the trigger down and you get this stream of bullets that hit towards the enemy. So you want to try to have fire that's actually going to be fairly well controlled and is going to damage the enemy. So what these guys have done before the battle is they sort of marked out where the 60 yard marker was. They stuck these little kind of stakes in the ground. So there was a little visual cue to these guys when they wanted them to fire. They didn't even want them to start opening up that early. We get a little bit of American apocrypha and I've seen sort of varying opinions on whether this is true or not. So I'm a romantic at heart, so let's assume it's true. Uh, these guys are saying don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. Meaning, don't fire until they're so close that you can tell that their eye has like a white part and a colored part. So that means basically when they're right on top of you. This takes a great deal of sort of control. But it also means that if you can hold your fire until they're right up on you, you're probably going to hit what you're aiming at. And that's exactly what takes place here. So you've got these two sort of armies that are heading sort of towards each other. Uh, actually, one sort of waiting for the other one to head towards it. The British, they go up the hill, and these guys hold fire, and then when they get really, really close to them, the Americans, they open up on them, and wham! They blow holes all in the British Army's line. These guys are dropping left and right, okay? And they knock them down the hill. You know, oh, this is a pretty big shot. And these British, these can fall down, the, they kind of tumble back down the hill. Americans, yeah! Right? But the Brits, they're professional soldiers. Oh, we took a pretty bad... Pretty bad <laughs> list of casualties. They reform their ranks, they fill the holes in, they get back together shoulder to shoulder. They come back. Americans are probably having a tightening in various parts of their body at this point. Ah! And so they kind of hold the fire and they start firing at them again as they get close. And wham! They knock the, knock the British guys down, they shoot a whole bunch of them, and then they Brits retreat down back to the bottom of the hill again. Reform their ranks, and they come back for round three. At this point, the American militia begins to run short on ammunition. And so the British now are able to get close enough to fix their bayonets, and they're able to charge into these guys' ranks. Now, for those of you who have never been stabbed before, I'm told it's not a lot of fun. And the bayonet, on the one hand, if you want us to just stand there and sort of get stabbed by one, the British soldiers, you know, they're more, you know, they're happy to oblige you. But for the most part, the bayonet is a terror weapon. It's designed to make you run away so you don't get stabbed. And that's exactly what takes place here. The American militia break, they break and they run, they retreat pell-mell off the peninsula. So if you look at just a straight-up territory kind of exchange, the Brits, they win. They win the Battle of Bunker Hill. But the reason that we talk about this, okay, is you want to zoom out. Because the Battle of Bunker Hill gives us a nice little preview, okay? Lessons that really both sides kind of take away from this. And that is, one, the Americans prove that they're not all that bad at soldiering. The British had kind of, eh, Peasants. I mean, they've got like, they're up to their second knuckle in their nose. I mean, these guys are idiots. We'll just drive them off, you know? We'll just drive them. They don't know what they're doing, okay? But after the battle, when they're looking at all their dead and wounded laying on the battlefield, you know, uh, sir, I don't think the Americans are total roots. I think that they know what they're doing uh, with this. It proves to the Americans the British aren't going to give up their foreign empire just because you give them a bloody nose. They're going to fight, and they're going to fight like the Dickens to try to hold on to. Uh, their empire. All of this fighting, all this military activity is going to precipitate another meeting of the Continental Congress. The first time we saw some sort of economic and political news, but now by the time the second Continental Congress is going to meet, they've got some serious problems to deal with. All the colonies are going to vote and they're going to send delegates to this meeting that takes place in Philadelphia. And they've got to now, before, they, they were able to sort of make suggestions. We suggest that you all boycott British goods. We suggest that Parliament changes. 
they, they can call it a vote, but now they've got to actually make some decisions. Okay, we've got fighting that's taking place in Massachusetts. What are we going to do about it? One of the things that you're going to see that you're not going to see is when these guys first get together in 1775, the urge for independence is actually very small. You got, you got a few like crackpots like John Adams. I think we ought to be voted in, be independent. Shut up, John. <laughs> ah, that's crazy talk. Okay, we're not uh, independent. Ah, you know, no, we're just fighting for our rights and liberty. We just want the parliament to recognize, you know, the right, certain rights that we have. Okay, so what are we going to do about the fighting that takes place in Boston? Does this involve all of us? Yeah, we need to prevent present some kind of united action. Uh, the Second Continental Congress's decision in this regard, and probably the best decision that it made in its lifespan, and I'm including eventually the Declaration of Independence in that, is to put George Washington in overall command of the army that was outside Boston, the Continental Army. They're, they're going to they're say, okay, this is now a basically a national army, or at least a, a, a pan-colonial army. One of the things that they needed was somebody who had military experience, was widely respected, and they needed a southerner. Because basically all the guys that were fighting here uh, were from up north, they were from New England. And in order to smooth over some of these intercolonial uh, strife, we needed to find somebody who was a southerner to prove that the southerners, there. you guys are involved in this as well, bring up some troops from the south to fight with these guys uh, as well. There's really only one person on the continent at that point that fit all of those requirements, and that was George Washington. Benjamin Franklin would later refer to George Washington as the indispensable man. He was the one guy that none of this would, would have worked without. There are a lot of people that pitched in. There are a lot of people that, that you look at they're sort of the superstars of kind of American history, and they're all alive uh, and working right around the same time. But without George Washington, all of this falls apart because the British won the war. All right? So they put George Washington in command. Uh, he sort of he puts on his hat, kisses his wife goodbye, and rides off uh, north from his home in northern Virginia uh, to Boston. But these guys, they do have sort of you know, they're, they're, they're not total sort of fire-eating, you know, martial people quite yet. Uh, and they say, they send a note to King George III. One of the things that, that you'll see in a lot of revolutions around the world, especially in the 1700s and the 1800s, is, well, the king or the monarch, whoever, he, he loves us. He is our benevolent sort of person. It's these lackeys of his in the government. They're the ones that are against us. And basically, they had been working with Parliament throughout this, this period, and it was Parliament that was really giving them the business. And so what they decide to do is appeal to King George III directly. And they say, listen, you need to put a stop to this. Get with Parliament. Get these guys that are running your government in line. We don't need to have, you know, sort of fighting. We're not, we're not after you. You know, we, we, we like being under your you know, rule for the most part. And we just, we just want our government to sort of go back to the way that it was before things got crazy. Things got out of hand. This is referred to as the Olive Branch Petition. That, you know, we'll call off all the fighting. You know, we'll come to some kind of amicable agreement. George III refused. He refused the Olive Branch Petition. And more importantly, he declared, because this was a united action by the 13 colonies, he declared the 13 colonies in rebellion. Okay? Now, rebellion is, we need to understand kind of the terms that we're talking about here. Okay? For those of you who have either, A, been a teenager, or B, had teenage children, the word rebellion kind of gets thrown out a little too flippantly to understand fully, right? Which is, well, I don't want to do what you say, you know, so I'm going to rebel against that, right? Okay, that, that's true. Okay, we use the term in that regard. But when you're a monarch and you declare somebody a rebel or in rebellion to you, that means that they're trying to kill you. Okay? You don't, you don't vote kings out, Right? And that's not how it works. Every four years, you know, we don't, we don't like how the President of the United States is doing. We'll vote them out. Or vote a new one in. Or however you want to look at it, right? You don't vote for kings, as Monty Python reminds us, right? You, the only way to remove them is when he dies. And if you want the term to expire early, you, you get the drift with this, okay? So kings take rebellion very seriously, which means you've got to whack me. Which means I have the right to whack you back. That's the way that this works. So declaring these colonies in rebellion now means that they can no longer sort of go along with this fiction of, well, no, we're fighting you, but we're still, we're not against you. You either lay down your weapons and surrender and say that you're going to swear your oath of allegiance to me, or you're a rebel, and I have every right to come after you and wipe you out. Well, as we're going to see, as the fighting begins to go on throughout 1775, uh, it's going to spiral sort of outward from Boston. It's going to head into New England, and eventually it's going to sort of 
uh, go downward into uh, New York and the mid-Atlantic states, and then eventually down into uh, the South. One of our more interesting characters uh, before he got into the furniture business was a Vermont patriot named Ethan Allen. Actually, I don't know that this is the same guy that got into the furniture business, but, but like I said, I'm a romantic, so why not, right? Uh, he was a militia leader. He had a, a, a small but effective uh, group of these militiamen that were operating uh, in the northern parts of sort of Vermont, New Hampshire, you know, along with now the Canadian border in sort of the woodland kind of frontier area. And they were called the Green Mountain Boys. So if you're ever going to sort of start a bluegrass band, maybe this would be a good name, or the Green Mountain Boys. Uh, they were called that. Uh, Vermont is known as the Green Mountain State. For those of you who habla French, right, uh, that's what Vermont actually literally translates to as Green Mountain. And uh, they call themselves the Green Mountain Boys. And they have been attacking a number of the British forts that were along what is now the Canadian border. And they're trying to push back basically the British forces uh, that are in the area. Now, a lot of the forts that they're taking, they're relatively sort of small, outlying, minimally manned kind of forts that it's pretty easy for these guys to sort of surround and force their surrender, uh, shoot up some of these guys. And basically all the ones that are able to get away from Ethan Allen, they all head to the main fort in the area, which is Fort Ticonderoga. Uh, in uh, upstate, um, upstate New England here, this, this area near the border. And, of course, they're all running in sort of wild eye. They're an American militia. They're all in the woods. They're crazy. They're taking all these fortresses. We barely escape with our lives. So the Brits that are in Fort Ticonderoga now are kind of whipped up into a, uh, into a tension uh, as a result of this. So they're just sort of hearing these wild kind of stories, all right? And the problem, of course, with... Ticonderoga is, Ticonderoga, unlike these other sort of forts, is not this small sort of affair. It's a big fort. High walls, extremely well fortified, massive siege artillery. You get too close to this thing, especially in daylight where they can see you, and they're going to blow you to smithereens. All right? So, <clears throat> Ethan Allen, as he approaches Fort Ticonderoga, basically the way that he had operated before uh, isn't going to work. He's not going to be able to surround it with his relatively small number of troops and sort of cow these guys into submission. Oh, it's the American militia. Just spare our lives. We'll surrender the fort. That's not going to work. Okay, they're not going to buy it. Uh, they're going to realize that they're very safe inside Fort Ticonderoga, uh, and they're not going to give it up to these guys. So Ethan Allen turns to psychological warfare. He understands that all these people have been sort of spreading rumors about this you know, crazy band of American militia rampaging uh, all throughout the, uh, the border area, and they've all been heading to Ticonderoga. So what he does, he has his men surround Ticonderoga at night and begin to fire on the fort intermittently and sort of shouting and yelling, basically to disguise his numbers. Because you can't really tell, you know, is it one guy firing and then moving over to another spot, or is it, just, is it a bunch of guys that are different firing intermittently? And so the guard is now all sort of flipped out, and just as the firing begins, uh, Ethan Allen goes to the door of the fort, sort of pounds on it, you know, let me in, right? So they open the door. Who is it? You know, and it's this young, he's like, I think he's like 18 year old, sort of British century. And Ethan, I am Colonel Ethan Allen of the American Army, and I demand to see the commander of the post, demand the surrender. I've got the fort surrounded, and we're going to just swamp you guys over. If you want to save the lives of your men, you need to surrender right now. Okay. And so the guy, he brings him in, and you know, I'll let you see the post commander. And uh, he takes him to the, uh, the place where the, the post commander was sleeping. Uh, and the sentry outside the door, he's a little older, and he's a little more wily. And something doesn't quite, there's not a lot of firing. It's not, it doesn't sound like a huge army outside. I don't know here, buddy. I think I may take you prisoner. Of course, Ethan Allen was ready for this. He pulls out a pistol and turns this guy's head into a canoe. So you still got a relatively young and impressionable British sentry who now, of course, has blood and brains splattered all over. I'll go get the post commander right now. And of course, the guy was getting dressed. He had just arrived not long before from England. His wife was there with him. She probably flipped out. I don't know if she'd ever heard gunfire before. And so he's in his nightshirt with his pants like half on when he comes to the door. And Ethan Allen gives him he gives him the, the riot act. He just, I'm Colonel Ethan Allen, and you're going to surrender the fort, or I'm going to slaughter all the men in your fort. You've heard about me taking all the other forts. And so the guy gives up. He, he coughs up the fort. <laughs> For those of you who play cards, you know this is called a bluff. You don't actually have to have the cards in your hand if the other people think you do. And that's exactly what's going to happen here. Ethan Allen uh, captures Fort Ticonderoga, and he captures all of his massive artillery. Right? This is going to work 
now in conjunction with what's going on uh, down by the coast here at Boston. Washington arrives at Boston, all right? And he begins to look over his army, and uh, Washington uh, immediately begins to complain about the fact that his army sucks. It is awful. No uniformity. These guys are terribly disorganized. They don't know what they're doing, okay? Uh, for those of you who ever coached a peewee football or soccer team or anything like that, you know, like five and six-year-olds, that's sort of what Washington was faced with. You guys know what you're doing? Oh, yeah, we're, we're doing Army stuff. Okay. So what do we do with these guys? An attack on Boston that's fortified the Brits. They, they're in command and control of all their – they've got all the advantages there. Uh, more importantly, the real key to this, Washington uh, had a good understanding of strategically, well, how to win. He didn't necessarily always have the tools that he needed to win, uh, but he understood how to win. And the key to defeating the British Army in Boston was actually the British Navy. Because if you, even if you got a huge number of these guys, you could push the British soldiers out of their barracks, and, and they would eventually just sort of fall back to the water side, where the British naval artillery would just blow you to pieces. Okay? So you could only get so close to the ships before the ships open fire on you and blow you away. More importantly, strategically, the British fleet would provide a safe haven for these guys to get uh, into. And if you leave the British fleet there long enough, eventually more British ships are going to show up with more supplies, more guns, more soldiers. So at some point, you've got you've to sever this lifeline. The problem is, how do you do that? Are we all going to swim out there and sort of take the British fleet by surprise? No, that kind of thing only happens in action movies. Okay? So you've got to find some way to be able to shell these guys. Hey, Ethan Allen just captured this massive fort with these huge guns, guns big enough to sink ships from the high seas. So he orders Ethan Allen to bring these guns from Ticonderoga down to Boston. Now, of course, you guys could go on sort of uh, some federal highways today to get from Fort Ticonderoga down to Boston, none of which existed here in 1775. And so they have to sled these, uh, these guns down using ox carts down the frozen rivers and the river valleys to get them down to Boston. They wouldn't actually arrive, and one morning the British sort of Navy the commander, they wake up, and you've got all these guns from these high places, so these huge pieces of artillery frowning down on your fleet. Guns big enough to put your fleet on the bottom of the harbor. Just at that point, messenger arrives from General Washington. He would like a meeting. So these British guys, they show up, and the British Army and Naval commanders, they show up, and Washington gives them a business. Hey, we got these huge pieces of artillery. You, all you got to do is see them. You guys pack up, you get out of here, or I blow your ships away. And then the next group of British ships that come in, I blow them away. And you guys in the, the town, you'll eventually starve to death. So beat it. They do. They give it up. In April of 1776, uh, on what the people of Boston still celebrate as Evacuation Day, the British, they pack up, they hop on board their ships, and they leave. Well, secret, Washington, he did have these huge pieces of artillery. He didn't have any ammunition for them. So, again, well, you know, what you can't accomplish in reality, you might be able to get by with on just straight up gumption. <clears throat> One of the other uh, major sort of issues that is taking place is how to expand the revolution here beyond uh, what was going on. And that was there were two, uh, we, we often sort of refer to you know, the 13 American colonies, blah, 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 blah. There were actually 15 American colonies at this point. Uh, the two that we don't talk about are uh, Canada and Florida. Both of them were uh, operated by the British at this point. Neither of them would join in the revolution. And what you're going to see here is at this point, uh, the Americans are going to uh, launch an invasion into Canada, uh, in part to make it sort of the 14th colony in rebellion to uh, British rule, but also to deny the British a strategic outpost right on kind of the flank uh, of the American sort of revolution. This would be one of the major problems, basically major sources of friction between the United States and Canada for a long, long time, in that the British could basically use this place as an outpost right next to the United States to cause a lot of problems. And the United States is very uncomfortable uh, with that for a, a long, long time. When we get to talking about the War of 1812 a little bit later, the United States is going to invade Canada again, uh, in part for uh, that reason. I can't think of any other reason to invade Canada unless you just don't think you have enough snow or something like that. But you're going to see that our main sort of leading figure, among other sort of generals, uh, attacking Canada from uh, via Maine is going to be Benedict Arnold. Now, I know a lot of people, wait a minute, I thought he was a traitor. Yeah, he would eventually turn traitor. But for a long time, Benedict Arnold was a pretty courageous and effective American general. Uh, sort of, you know, 
like a lot of people who sort of turn bad, they don't start out bad. You know, Anakin was a pretty good guy before he turned to the dark side. Uh, Benedict Arnold is actually been a pretty effective uh, American leader, but they do make serious headway. They would attack the city of Quebec really in kind of the same sort of method that they tried to use uh, when it was a French colony during the French and Indian War, you know, cross the rivers or scale the heights. But bad weather, bad American coordination, nobody wanted to admit kind of who the top general was uh, in this, that kind of, uh, you know, didn't have a lot of unity of command, and in some cases just straight out bad luck. You know, the, uh, Brit the British noticing through the fog kind of where the Americans were and being able to stop them uh, means that the Americans can't take Quebec. They can't take Quebec. They have to eventually fall back. However, when you look at this strategically, while the United States doesn't capture Canada uh, at this point, they do push the British Army all the way back to the St. Lawrence River militarily. And so what we're going to see is once the British kind of get over the initial shock of being hit by the Americans in places like Boston uh, and in upstate New England, they're going to go on all, they're going to go from defense to offense. That means though that they're going to they're going to sort of start from a much much further uh, distance in order to attack the Americans, uh, especially in places like New York. Once they finally go on offense in 1776 and 1777. For those of you again who are sort of familiar with sports, no, the Americans don't score but they do bury a punt deep, deep, deep in the opponent's territory. So it's going to force them, when they do go on offense, they have to go a much, much longer uh, distance. Well, the British, like we saw at Bunker Hill, and like we're going to see after you know, all the fighting in Boston dies down, they're not just going to give up their American colonies. Oh, we lost. Well, that's it. We, we quit. Uh, but they do need a base of operations. They are going to need a base of operations in order to uh, in order to operate here uh, militarily in, uh, in America. They're going to set their sights south after the defeat of Boston on New York City. New York is a great location for these guys. One, New York is full of a lot of people who actually pretty much like the British Empire. Two, it is the best port facility in the United States still today. It is the best port we have anywhere. <clears throat> it is right at the terminus of the Hudson River, which at that point, the Hudson was the Mississippi of the colonial era deep, wide, navigable river. You can go really far into the interior of, of America from this point. If you capture all of it, you basically cut you know, uh, American uh, war effort in kind of two pieces, that which is north of it, that which is south of it. Uh, and so extremely valuable militarily, politically, strategically, just all around, New York City is great. Well, the Continental Congress, they ordered General Washington to try to hold on to the city. Now, if you don't think about geography, New York City is strung out on a series of islands. And if you're Washington, you've got this kind of ragtag army, and you have absolutely no navy, and you've got to fight these professional soldiers who are backed up by the most powerful navy in the world on a series of islands where you can be very easily cut off and surrounded on the water, this sounds like a pretty dumb proposition. And that's because it is. Washington said so. Said, said as much. Hey, uh, no. <laughs> I don't think we should fight New York City. It's a bad situation because if we get defeated, we'll have no place to retreat to if the British Navy cuts us off. And of course, the Congress said, well, we can't just give up New York. It's our biggest, most populous, uh, one of our wealthiest cities. So you got to go and fight for it. That's just all there is to it. So, all right. Uh, the British then land a very large force. And they would eventually fight Washington in uh, what is now Brooklyn. Now, again, it would be hard for you to imagine sort of Brooklyn as rolling farmland, but that's what Brooklyn looked like here uh, in 1776. And the Americans, they do pretty well for a while. But, of course, they're inexperienced, they're outmatched, and they're facing the British. And eventually the Brits are going to march these guys kind of through a cornfield. They're going to come in on the Americans' flank. Uh, and Americans are going to, their, their front's going to kind of buckle, and they're forced to retreat. Fortunately, some fog comes in and keeps the line of retreat open, and now they've got to get these American soldiers off the island and get them away to safety. And that's exactly what's going to happen here. So now the American army is completely changed both. It's gone from defend New York City to prevent our own destruction. We've got to get out of here safely so that way we don't lose everything. We, we lost New York. New York is gone. We're not going to hold it. We've got to be able to fight again another day, though. Uh, and that is where Washington really begins to shine as a general. Some of the best instances of Washington as a general is during the worst situations. 
And when things are not going bad, we don't, we don't have a lot of images of sort of George Washington riding, you know, to victory. We have a lot of images of George Washington sort of staving off defeat at the last second. And that's what he's going to do here. He personally directs the retreat of the Americans across the river uh, back to safety. And he organizes the rear guard to keep the British Army from pursuing these guys. He keeps them away from his soldiers. He organizes who's going to be in what boats. And eventually, as the day sort of wears on, right, and all the American soldiers, they can see Washington doing this, okay? It becomes pretty apparent, like, all right, we got pretty much everybody away to safety. We're, we're going to survive. And, of course, a lot of Washington staff, hey, all right, General, time for you to go ahead. We'll, we'll handle the last few bits of this. You need to get you out of here because you know, it's not safe. Washington refused to leave, okay? He got everybody off. Washington was the last man on the last boat retreating from Brooklyn. This is a powerful sort of image for his soldiers. I got this from a sixth grader's uh, website, this little battle map, which proves that you can learn a lot from people who you should be smarter than. But uh, this, is the, this is the overall sort of battle map. Fighting takes place in Brooklyn. The Americans that come across here, uh, they fight these guys. They do pretty well. But then eventually the British would outflank the Americans left. Uh, and as I've contended for a long time, uh, nothing really explains warfare as well as plastic soldiers. So uh, this is a little plastic soldier battle. Uh, the Americans are sort of engaging these guys here in Brooklyn. But as you can see, eventually the British are going to outflank the American left. Uh, and they're going to take these guys by uh, surprise. Right? Now, if you were not in the Army, and you know, just like today, most, most people aren't in the Army, even in, in active sort of military campaigning, only a per tiny percentage of people are even fit enough to be in an Army and have the ability to go off and fight. So you're walking the streets or the, or the little country lanes of America here in the spring of 1776, you're probably abreast of what's going on. You know, you know what's happening, and then there are big things that are taking place. So what's your opinion of this? How, how are things going? You know, if you were to look at things in the spring of 1776, and someone was to ask you, you know, do you, do you support you know, the fighting that's taking place? And a lot of people would, yeah, yeah, I'm for it. You know, I really think this is something we need to do. Well, why? What are you, what are you fighting for? Well, we're defending our liberty. You know, we don't we don't like the British Empire. They're sort of, you know, crushing us. We, we have certain rights that uh, the British are sort of infringing on. And they may not have used that exact kind of language, but that was sort of the way that they understood this. That uh, they were they were fighting to sort of prevent the British Empire from sort of crushing. Them. Now, of course, attacking Canada, you know, but that was essentially kind of a military thing and not necessarily a social political kind of thing, right? A lot of people still thought of themselves as loyal to the king. Yeah, the king, we don't have to get rid of the king. We don't have to do this kind of stuff. Although there were a lot of people that were very much against the king. Um, we, we, we don't necessarily want a lot of independence. You know, we don't, we don't want political independence. Right? But George III's declaration here that the 13 colonies were in rebellion, they forced a choice. You either were against the king or you were going to give up. You either fight for now independence from his government because there's never going to be any point where he's going to say, all right, you guys, yeah, okay, you guys can have more political liberty you want, but I'm still going to be in charge. That, 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 that sort of bridge has been burned, okay? So you now have two choices. You can give up and be a loyal King George III citizen and do whatever he says, or you continue to fight now for an own independent government. So this is the point when you're going to see that amongst the American public, a large upswell begins to openly sort of discuss the idea, all right, if we do declare independence, how, when, what, you know, should we, how, and so there's a lot of questions surrounding this. And into this comes a sort of revolutionary kind of guy, Thomas Paine. And uh, he produces a pamphlet called Common Sense. Common Sense was basically the viral video, political viral video of its day, all right? That sort of gets passed around. Now, of course, they don't have the internet to be able to do this, but the pamphlet was the, the quick sort of three-minute YouTube video of its day. Because what you could do is you could buy it for relatively cheap for the printing cost. You could read it. It would sum up its sort of points in just a few pages and then pass it off to a friend. Hey, you should read that. I should read this. All right? And the way that he phrases this is pretty simplistic kind of argumentative style. He argues that it's impossible for an island like England, a tiny little place, to govern a growing American nation. And he actually puts that thing as like, can an island govern a continent? You know, that kind of thing. And he says that any kind of monarchical form of government 
isn't going to do for a nation that basically is used for a, a more or less a democratic form of government. The Americans, they were electing their own legislatures. They were electing their own officials. They were used to kind of running things for themselves. Uh, they didn't have representation in parliament, but they really had all the trappings of a democratic government. And any kind of monarchical government where one guy is born sort of better than anybody else, in a Republican sort of ideal where everybody is born more or less equal, those two ideas, they really don't jive, okay? Common sense becomes a sensation. And it pushes the popularity of the idea of independence. And Congress now begins to openly entertain the idea. So that when John Adams gets up, so, I think we should vote for independence. They don't immediately tell him to shut up. Although they would eventually get around to do that because John Adams is a pretty abrasive kind of uh, personality, all right? So Congress now, the Second Continental Congress, is beginning to sort of push now towards this. And the question begins to change from should we to how do we, all right? They would finally pass a resolution on July 2nd of 1776 that says, okay, that's it, we're independent. So technically, if you want to be sort of anal pretentive about this, July 2nd should be our national birthday rather than July 4th, but we're not going to be like that. Okay, we celebrate it on July, on July 4th because the 4th of July is when they adopt the Declaration publishing not only, hey, we're independent, but here's why. Here's why we're independent, to give you sort of a background of this. Because over the course of July 3rd, uh, after they pass the resolution, and then on from July 2nd into July 3rd, is we got to just explain this. We can't just say we're doing this because King George III is going to say, you guys are crazy people. You, you, there's no reason for it other than, oh, well, you Americans in the Congress... You want control of the money and the power, and that's why you're doing this. You're just trying to replace me with yourselves. And these guys, they, when they thought about it, no, we have a higher purpose for this. Okay? And so they put together a committee to kind of come up with a resolution, and Thomas Jefferson was kind of tapped to be the main writer uh, of this. And so over the course of the night of July 3rd, he comes up with basically what is almost completely uh, adopted. Uh, with only a few minor editorial changes by the committee of the Declaration of Independence, all right? And it serves, you know, a couple of functions. One, all right, world, we're independent. We are no longer part of the British Empire. Two, now that we're independent, we are forming a new country called the United States of America, all right? This is an extremely dangerous move. As the Americans that back independence, including all the people that would later go on to sign the Declaration uh, of Independence, all the guys that voted on it, they put a giant target on their chests and on the top of their head and on their back and basically every other part of their body because they are admitting that they are traitors to the crown, that they are working towards a political government that completely removes the King of England from their control. So this is dangerous kind of stuff. Uh, our sort of historical record tells us, and again, we're not totally sure if this is true, although I kind of believe the quote is that Benjamin Franklin comes up with the quote after this, gentlemen, we must hang together or we will surely hang separately. And a lot of the guys that would go on to uh, vote on the uh, vote for the Declaration of Independence, they're going to get caught by the British, and bad things are going to happen to them. A lot of them are going to wind up broke from supporting the war effort, and several of them are going to wind up dead as a result of this. So this is dangerous kind of stuff, not just for the signers of the Declaration of Independence, but also for all those who would go on to support it and fight for it. Now this is our Declaration of Independence, what's left of it. You can go and see it on display uh, in the Capitol, uh, up in, in, the, in Washington, D.C. Uh, today. Uh, it's not in great shape because we thought, hey, we could cool, you know, this is sort of our family photo album uh, of America. And so we hung it on the wall for uh, huge number of years, and of course every afternoon the sun would hit it, which would cause it to fade. I think it was just in like a picture frame or something like that. Now it's in like one of those vacuum seal plexiglass you know, kind of thing that like drops into a vault. Like if, we, if Washington is nuked, the rest of us are screwed. We're all going to die, but you know, the aliens that discover Earth, you know, a thousand years from now, they'll be able to read our political documents from the 1700s. So anyway, uh, that's what's left of it, alright? Now, we need to stop and tarry a moment, right, on, well, what is the Declaration? What is in it? Because it's, it's really a lot deeper than just saying, okay, we're independent, and this is why, and then, you know, we're United States of America now. Because there's really some fundamental kind of stuff in there, right? And for those of you who are going to wind up writing argumentatively later, like, say, the next time there's a test in this class, pretty soon, right? Uh, the Declaration is a good little map of how to write argumentatively, how to use facts, how to use persuasiveness, how to get to the real heart of a matter in order to 
persuade your audience that your uh, argument is correct. So in the Declaration, Jefferson arguments, argues that independence is justified. It is justified. It's not something that we just sort of came up with. We're independent. Why? We hate King George. His wig is never on straight. Screw that guy. Right? It's, it's not that. There are actually several reasons, and they are three basically uh, consequent reasons. One follows from the other. One, he makes a statement about all of humanity. Now, no, he didn't necessarily uh, intend this to be uh, about all of humanity, but when you follow his line of reasoning, you'll see that it is. He argues that all humans are born with unalienable rights. And I included a little bit of the language from uh, the uh, Constitution, or the Declaration of Independence, because we don't really use the word unalienable, inalienable, you know, that kind of language anymore. That basically means it can't be taken away from you. Okay? And the reason for that is because they were endowed by God. Your creator is actually the, uh, the term that they use. So, therefore, human governments can't take them away because they come from something that is uh, superseding all human government anywhere on earth. You have certain rights that are inherent to you being uh, a person. And if all of these people uh, have these rights and they're all made by God, then therefore they are all inherently equal. All people are inherently uh, equal. Now, of course, if you read the document, it says all men are created equal because of their unalienable rights. And you look at a guy like Thomas Jefferson and say, well, surely he didn't, he, didn't mean, he didn't mean black people because he was a slave owner. And if you read some of his later writings, uh, he was not very kind <laughs> to uh, African Americans. Uh, he never released his slaves, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but the Declaration of was more right than even Jefferson was willing to admit to himself. Because if you look at this and you say, well, all men are created equal. Why? Because they were, they were created by God. And they were born with all of these rights. Well, were black men created by God? Well, yeah. Uh, what about women? He doesn't mention women at all, right? And then Jefferson was also a noted misogynist. He was not a big fan of women's equality and that kind of thing. Were women created by God? Well, yeah. But, you know, society says that. So one of the things that had to happen in order for this to really, really work was you had to get to some truth. And I mean like capital T kind of philosophical, deep sort of understanding humanity kind of truth. And Jefferson got there. And when he got there, in order to make the rest of this work, I don't even think that he was necessarily comfortable with like how far this went. Uh, there was, there's been a struggle. There's a struggle uh, for a long time to sort of live up to the lofty ambitions of the Declaration. But having established this now, okay, uh, in the Declaration, that, all right, people are born with an alien right. You have rights. And you're, in, and you're equal, okay? Well, the relation, the proper relationship of a government to an individual, and, and if this starts to sound, this sounds a lot like language of the Enlightenment, that's because it is. In many cases, all that Jefferson was doing was lifting ideas that were already out there in the common parlance of a lot of the Enlightenment writers. He doesn't invent all this sort of himself. He comes up with a, a lot of, he puts together a lot of these ideas that were already out there. So the government exists, or at least it should exist, in the form to protect the rights and liberties of the individual. That is its purpose. This is straight out of John Locke, the Enlightenment writer. Uh, you know, guys like, that had the ideas of social contract. There's a contract between the government and the government. And just like any contract, when one party breaches it, the other party has the right to annul it. And that's exactly what takes place here. So if the government exists uh, in order to protect the rights of individuals, what do you do if these rights are trampled. Well, a lot of the space of the Declaration of Independence goes through a fairly long list of how George III's government had trampled these rights. Some of them are spot on. Some of them are kind of exaggerations that were taking place sort of like, yeah, it kind of happened, but it didn't happen in the way that Jefferson kind of wrote it. And some of them were sort of uh, creative histories, <laughs> if you will. They weren't really true. But it did create the idea that, that George's government had trampled the rights of the American colonists. Thus, okay, so if you go through these three kind of points, Jefferson concludes that the Americans, they have every right to declare their independence, annul their relationship to the British Empire, and thus then make a new nation that would be built along the proper social contract with its people that it would protect the rights of the individual. So if you read through, the, for example, the Declaration of Independence and then later uh, the Constitution, man, they really spend a lot of time talking about how Congress is supposed to defend your right here or not trample your right there. That's why, because the founders' belief was that the government exists to protect you. 
Well, with the issuing now of the Declaration of Independence, another sort of Rubicon kind of moment has been crossed. You, you can't go back on uh, this. The declaration that the American colonies were in rebellion sort of forced Americans to take sides, and now really it gets cemented with the publishing of the Declaration of Independence. And basically, you're going to split the nation uh, fairly quickly into two sides. Okay? You, one, you've got the patriots. And this comes from the Latin word patria, which means fatherland. Okay, these are the people that, oh, I'm for the fatherland. How dare you be against us and that kind of thing. So the patriot, these are the guys that favor the independence. They're going to fight for it. Okay? And then you have the loyalists. And these are the people that, as their name would suggest, they want to remain loyal to the king. Now, what's interesting here is when you look at how things play out chronologically. We would, we would like to think back, you know, we go to these like 4th of July sort of celebrations and there's fireworks and we're waving American flags and we're, you know, we watch these uh, sort of uh, movies, you know, and Americans sort of beat the British uh, in this war. That Well, all the Americans, they were just, just gung-ho for the war effort and they were just all over, you know, ready to lay down their lives on the altar of liberty, you know, that kind of thing. It's really not true. Uh, actually, at the beginning, you had sort of three major groups of people. You had the people that were the patriots, you know, they're gung-ho, and then you had the people that were the loyalists, and they were equally gung-ho for their uh, cause. They were, no, we're loyal to the king. We took oaths of loyalty to King George's government. We can't oppose him. And then you had a lot of people that were either neutral or sort of so far out on the frontier, they didn't care or they didn't want to get involved because, man, that's a good way to get yourself shot and get involved in a war, okay? And at the beginning, they were all about equal. There were about a third of Americans were for independence, and that's it. You had about a third that wanted to remain loyal, and about a third that really wanted to wait and see if anything would be invented to be put on television at that point. They really wanted to stay out of it, okay? However, however, what you're going to see is the patriots are going to succeed over the course of time in winning over parts of the population to their, uh, to their cause. As the war progressed, they're going to convert many, but they're also going to drive out a lot of loyalists. Also, you're going to see a large number of these people that were kind of neutral at the beginning. A lot of them are going to shift over and are going to want to join the Patriot side for varying reasons. But what you're also going to see is as a result of this here uh, is really you've got two wars going on that are going to be taking place here. One, you've got the, the, the regular sort of military campaign style of war where you've got the George Washington types, you've got the Horatio Gates, Benedict Arnold types versus the Lord Cornwallis, General Howe, General Burgoyne types. There's a war between American military forces and British military forces in the United States of America, the British Empire, you know, that kind of thing. But it's also a civil war in the fields and the streets of America where you've got loyalists and you've got American patriots, and they're going to fight each other. And I don't mean like verbal sort of barbs at the post office. I mean like fight. Businesses are going to get burned down. People are going to get shot. So you've got a revolutionary war, an independence war, going on sort of right on top of and in amongst a civil war between Americans. So let's look at these two groups. We've got the patriots. Who are they? And why, why, you know, so why do they join you know, this side? And what are they doing? Generally speaking, middle class people you would see on the Patriot side. So your average sort of middle of the road uh, American economically, you're probably going to be a Patriot. Does that mean that there are no sort of middle class farmers or middle class merchants that were loyalists? No, there were. Okay? Generally speaking, if you're a middle class sort of farmer or merchant, you don't have sort of huge amounts of money, uh, and you're not a worker for somebody who has huge amounts of money, uh, you're probably going to be a patriot, all right? They're motivated by the ideas of liberty. To them, you know, you see them sort of spouting off, you know, no taxation without representation, you know, causes of liberty and freedom, rights of man, you know, that kind of stuff, all right? The idea of political independence, Americans should govern themselves, we have no votes in the British you know, Empire, that kind of stuff. They also believe that the idea of continued westward advancement was necessary for both economic expansion and also social advancement. You got, we got to do something with these people, you know, as we're cranking out huge numbers of kids. But they also believe in the idea of social mobility. Wherever you're born is not necessarily the part of society where you're going to die. British Empire, you know, they don't, they don't believe in that kind of thing, right? The strongest sort of strain of the Patriot phenomenon you'll find in New England, right? This is kind of the hotbed of old sort of 1600 sort of Whig political philosophy that, you know, anti-monarchy, anti-king, pro-independence, you know, don't tell me what to do, you know, that kind of thing. Okay? But that doesn't mean that there's not uh, throughout the rest of the, the other 13, uh, throughout the 13 states. There are a lot of these people all throughout the place. And we'll see that, for example, at least in one instance, uh, the British are going to make the mistake of thinking that the South is full of loyalists 
and so they'll, they'll be greeted by the nice warm welcome in the South. Yeah, there are a few more loyalists in parts of the South, but as we're going to see, that is also where the British Army is going to meet its swan song, uh, is in Virginia and the Carolinas. All right? Many of these guys are going to bankroll the war, and they're going to bankrupt themselves as a result of this. They're going to put their heart and soul into the war, and they're not going to get anything out of this. Okay? Many of them are tortured to death by the British, uh, <clears throat> including about half the signers of the Declaration uh, of the uh, Declaration of Independence. Uh, I don't know that it was quite so bad if you see the Mel Gibson film The Patriot, where these people were sort of packed into a church and set on fire. I don't know if it was quite that bad, but you would see mass hangings. Uh, that was that was pretty bad. That was, that was a pretty rough way uh, to go with these guys. All right, what about the loyalists? These are these are the guys that are going to uh, be on the side of the British. Generally speaking, they're the well-off city folk. Or, or people that are directly connected to the well-off city folk. Now, of course, many of them are going to have direct connections to the government. Naturally, you would include government officials. If the king is paying your salary, the odds of you, uh, you know, sort of trying to fight off his rule are pretty low. All right? This would include William Franklin, Benjamin Franklin's son. So it didn't matter if you had a sort of hyper-patriot father. This is a civil war. This is going to split up families. Uh, he is going to side with the British uh, government. He's a British uh, government official. He viewed that it was his duty to remain loyal. Uh, of course, his side is going to lose the war, and he's going to go back to England, and he and his father are really never going to have a relationship again after that. They're going to sort of live separate lives uh, as a result. Of Don't feel too bad, because Benjamin Franklin's going to have more than enough illegitimate children to have a big family. So for those of you who are kind of worried, oh, that's so sad, he loses his son, trust me, he makes fuck for it like a billion times over. So... You're also going to see the wealthy merchants are going to fall into this category because while they may not be uh, directly linked to the uh, government a as a paid employee, they are going to have ties to the government. Getting, uh, as we've seen, the parliament sort of passes out special favors to big business, and they're the ones getting the favors. And so they don't want to see their uh, sort of golden goose go away. These large business owners in the cities are also going to see the Indians. The Indians are going to side with the British government, generally speaking, over the patriot cause. They are going to attack the Patriots, and they are going to be attacked by the Patriots. Like I said, houses, businesses, they're going to get burned. People are going to get beaten on the streets. Few people are going to get shot. Now, over the course of time, some of these people who were kind of lukewarm loyalists, uh, they would join the Patriot cause, especially after seeing the British cruelty uh, to what they were doing to a lot of these people that got caught. They didn't know that you know when the king says rebellion, the way you respond to rebellion is you crush it. I mean, you, you crush it, crush it. They're also going to see a few American victories after a course of time. You know, you, you stay loyal to the king. Well, the king is going to win. He's got a huge army. He's got a huge navy. After the Americans win at places like Saratoga, maybe not. Maybe the Americans can win. And so if you're only loyal to the British king because you think they're going to win, okay, remember a Fairweather fan is still a fan, okay? Uh, and that's what's going to take place here. Now, many of these, uh, part of the reason that the percentage of loyalists is going to go down over the course of the war is a lot of people are forced out of America. <laughs> uh, they're going to be beaten, shot at, or just straight up driven from their homes, and they're going to have to take refuge someplace else. A lot of them are going to wind up in Canada. A few are going to wind up down here in Florida. A lot of them are going to wind up hopping on ships and heading back to England. And they're going to be uh, treated this way by the Patriots. So what's going to happen is their percentage is going to go down because they leave. Or they're going to be trapped in places that are already under British control, like New York, New Jersey, uh, Philadelphia, uh, places like that. And so they're not going to have as much impact on the course uh, of the war as time would go on. Right? Well, after driving Washington out of uh, New York City, uh, General Howe is going to go after Washington's army because he realizes that Washington's army is really kind of the nexus of the revolution. You can destroy the Continental Army. Uh, you can really kind of go wherever you want to go uh, in, in America. You know, if there's a rebellion over here, you just march in there and stand there. You know, rebellion over there, you march over there, uh, beat the stuff out of those people. Washington's army is the only thing that's keeping you from doing that. Okay? So he's going to go after Washington in New Jersey. And to make a very long story short, for those of you who've had you know, sort of too much of New Jersey uh, on TV anyway, right? Uh, he's going to succeed mightily. He's going to give uh, Washington's army thrashing, kind of after thrashing, and beating the stuffing out of Washington throughout, uh, 18, uh, throughout 1776. And so by the end of the year, right, Washington has been driven completely out of the state of New Jersey. He's in eastern Pennsylvania, across the Delaware River, Delaware River from New Jersey. And basically the Continental Army is at the point of going home, right? A lot of these guys... Uh, are 
Some of them are threatening to desert. They're just going to you know, throw their hand and screw it. I'm, I'm packing up my stuff and I'm leaving. All right? And a lot of them, though, they're not really, well, we're not going to go away yet, but our enlistment is up. December 31st, and on January 1st, we're done. We, they signed three-month or six-month papers to fight for a certain period of time, and then once that's it, well, we're not going to re-enlist, you know. Because it's one thing to sort of lay down your life in a glorious struggle that leads to victory, but nobody wants to get shot and die in a war you're going to lose anyway. This is why morale in armies is important, okay? You've got to keep these guys thinking that they're going to win. Because once they realize that they're not going to win, they're not going to fight anymore. So Washington has to do something, okay? He has to do something to prevent this from happening because if his army just goes home, then that's it. War is over. So the plan that Washington comes up with is utterly insane, okay? But he's got to do something, and he's got to do something fast. So what he does is he gets his army together, and they're going to they're gonna have one sort of, as he tells us, one final raid uh, on the enemy. And they pick Christmas night, the night of December 25th, 1776, and his plan is to attack these members of the British military, okay, that are just across the river here, okay, uh, in New Jersey, and uh, at night under the cover of darkness, okay. But in order to do this, the military moves that he has to pull off with are crazy, all right. First, you've got to get all these guys in boats, get them across the Delaware River, at night, and it's full of ice, okay? Getting soldiers onto boats and then across water is incredibly difficult and dangerous by itself. To do it at night in an icy river with no radios is nuts, okay? This should not have worked, okay? They should have all just fallen in the water, all right? Then you've got to get them all sort of gathered back together on the other side of the river, which is going to be kind of tough in the darkness and in the cold. And then divides his army into two parts, one to attack uh, these, uh, these guys from the front, and then one to hit the town from the back, marching through the woods at night on a timetable with no radios for communication. Just, you just got to sort of do it and then hope that things turn out for the best. Crazily enough, everything sort of locks into place for Washington and his Continental Army. The guys that he winds up attacking are Hessian mercenaries. They're not actually British soldiers. They're fighting for the British Army. They're Germans. They're mercenaries. They're paid to be in the British Army. Uh, remember how we had talked about before how the uh, Brits have plenty of money? One of the things they can buy is soldiers. Okay, From the German principality of Hesse. So they're, they're Hessians. All right? And they're doing what Germans do a lot of time, especially on Christmas night, and that is they're getting drunk. They're hammered out of their minds. Okay, Because it's Christmas, you know. I did not, you know, so they're, they're, they're pretty, uh, they're three sheets to the wind, and at that point is when Washington's army attacks from both sides in almost perfect coordination well, with themselves. The Germans are really too drunk to offer a whole lot of resistance, and Washington's men, they're going to they're gonna win this battle here, and they're going to capture uh, over a thousand H Hessian mercenaries, okay? Massive success, all right? When you look at them, the grand scale of things, okay, capturing a bunch of drunk Germans, I mean, even a thousand of them, it's not going to put the British Army out of business, okay? It's not like the next morning, General Howe or anybody's going to wake up, oh, you captured a thousand of them, that's it, we quit, okay? The grand scheme of things, it's, it's, it's a little victory, okay, militarily. It's not this huge kind of thing. But in terms of the morale effect that it has on Washington's army, it is exactly what they need, exactly when they need it. And that is, Washington's men are elated. They have a victory. They won. We're not, not going to lose. And all of a sudden, all those reasons that they had joined the army in the first place come flooding back. They re-enlist. They decide they're going to stay on for the struggle for at least a little while longer. <clears throat> Howe has captured New York City and basically all of New Jersey. I don't know why he would want New Jersey, but he's got it. Okay? And now he's going to set his sights on moving down to capture the American political capital uh, of Philadelphia, all right? And he's going to move his army by water because Philadelphia is a port city. And he is going to attack these guys by moving up the kind of the Delaware um, part of uh, Delaware, Maryland kind of area to attack Philadelphia from the, town, the south. Now, actually, Washington, is, he's got to move, he's got to defend Philadelphia. Philadelphia is... Uh, kind of the number two city in America economically, but also it is the political capital. You've got to hold on to this uh, if you can. And he's going to meet 
Uh, he's going to meet Howe's army just outside Philadelphia at a place called Brandywine Creek. And he's going to do okay for a while. He's holding these guys on the other side of the creek, and they're doing okay. And eventually, though, the, he, Washington is sort of like a master swordsman in a lot of ways um, who's given inferior blades to duel with. And so he'll be doing pretty well for a while, and then the sword breaks because it's made from cheap metal or something like that. And that's exactly what happens here. The American militia, they can only sort of take so much pounding before, okay, that's it. <laughs> We're done. And they leave. And then they leave a huge gap in the line, and the British are going to pour through. And so the British are going to drive Washington's army off. Washington's forced to send a note to the uh, Continental Congress. You guys got to bail. <laughs> you guys got to get out of town like now. All right? And so the British are going to capture Philadelphia. All right? So the new U.S. government would manage to flee successfully. These guys do get away for the most part. Not all of them, right? And the British now, they're able to go into the city and they're able to enjoy the hospitality of uh, the city's loyalists. This is especially true for General Howe, who apparently got himself a girlfriend. So uh, part of the problem that we're going to see uh, through much of the military campaign is uh, Howe had a different military campaign that he was embarked on kind of at this point. Rather than with his army, it was with his lady friend. So uh, he was busy doing that. And another part of the problem here is not only how kind of uh, just kind of hanging out in Philadelphia, but really he wasn't even supposed to be in Philadelphia in the first place. And the orders that he had received from the British High Command was he needed to stay in New York City, the New York, New Jersey kind of area, because another British general, a guy named Burgoyne, was going to be marching down to New York City from Canada and that he needed to be on hand in case that guy needed help. So he needed to be fairly close by. But how, one, he just he wanted to capture Philadelphia, you know, and then he wanted to stay in Philadelphia for his own reasons. But two, he hated Burgoyne. He and Burgoyne, you know, Burgoyne, you do whatever you're going to do. I don't, I don't care. I don't, I don't, you know. So I'm, I'm, I'm how, and you're not. So this is a major source of military problem. I really like this, uh, this little artist's print. I don't know who did it. Um, but it gives you kind of the, the two sort of parts of the American army uh, at this uh, during the Revolutionary War. You had parts that, of guys that were professionals. Now, I'm not going to try to tell you that the, the Continentals, the guys in the uniforms, the guys in the dark blue uniforms, I'm not going to say that necessarily man for man they were the equal of the British army, but they were pretty good. They, that's all that they did was they trained, they fought, you know, they were, they were pretty good. Okay? They, they, they're basically a match, more or less, for the British army. But you also, you always had a huge chunk in any engagement of these guys, American militia. They're in their regular civilian clothes, and they don't train. In many cases, many of them wouldn't even show up to the battlefield until, you know, an invading army was right at the gates. So their ability in combat was suspect. And in many cases, they became famous for running away, that, that in fact, some of them Units were sort of more famous because they ran away faster uh, from these. And I like the, the print because it kind of gives you these ideas. The Continentals are back. They know what they're doing. They're level. Bolts being shot past them. They're firing. And then you got this guy who looks like, how does this thing work again? <laughs> what's, what's this musket thing everybody's talking about? So uh, this is one of the major problems that Washington is going to have to deal with. And really, all the American commanders are going to have to deal with. All right, we got all these. You know, we got hundreds of these guys. Well, good. Well, they're a militia. Oh, crap. Right? You know, uh, what good are they if they run off in the middle of the fighting? Right? When we look, though, at the military campaign that takes place uh, and begins to unfold here in upstate New York, our, our main kind of commanders, okay, uh, on the British side, you've got General Burgoyne. And on the American side, you've got uh, General Arnold, General Gates. Uh, and they are, they've got their own sort of uh, problems to deal with here away from uh, Washington's army. Right? Burgoyne begins the invasion of America from the north. He starts at Quebec and he goes down the Hudson River. All right? He's got a very large force of both British soldiers and a huge number of Indian allies. But it's, it's almost like comedic in terms of the logistical problems. Um, he allows a large number of women to uh, accompany the campaign, uh, I guess for morale reasons. I mean, I guess I mean it's nice to have ladies around, but you know. If you've ever gone anywhere with women, they carry a lot of stuff with them. And so this slows the army down a whole lot. Uh, the Indians, you know, he reads his, their complaint, he's like, they brought their squaws with them. What is their problem? And, you know, they got wagon loads of stuff uh, that they've got. The army moves extremely slowly. And, of course, this is complicated by the fact that essentially there are no roads through parts of these areas, okay? 
And so you got these wagons that are trying to go through this area, and the army is moving very, very quick, very, very slowly. What this does is this, this, the size of this army really alarms the American commanders, uh, Benedict Arnold, Ratio Gates, and a bunch of the other ones. Hey, there's this huge army, and it's moving down the Hudson River, and if they capture all of it, then we're screwed, okay? Because, one, we can't, you know, move our troops back and forth. We can't go in, you know, uh, towards the coast, away from the coast. Uh, this is a major, major problem if this happens. But they've got all these troops. Fortunately, the fact that Burgoyne has to start all the way back at the St. Lawrence River slows it down. Burgoyne's own sort of sloth slows them down, okay? And so this gives Arnold and Gates time, time to gather forces in order to meet this threat. And what they would do is throughout a lot of this period, as they're sending for help, hey, somebody send troops from wherever, we don't care. We've got to come up, we've got to fight these guys. We've got to keep them out of the Hudson River Valley. Uh, what they would do is they would send these sort of small little raiding party sort of engagements to go and attack Burgoyne's army. They knew they weren't going to defeat him. Okay. What they would do is they kind of pop shots at him, and they would kind of go at him, and then force his army to stop, deploy, and then right, retreat. It would slow them down. Okay. Anything that they could do to slow these guys down, they would take that opportunity. All right. And one of the things that really should have been obvious to Burgoyne as time went on was these little skirmishes started getting bigger and bigger because more and more Americans were starting to show up uh, on the battlefields. All right. What's going to take place is a series of battles that are going to go kind of back and forth between the British and the ever-growing American army. Eventually what's going to happen, though, is the British realize that we're, we're starting to get kind of badly outnumbered. They would pull back to a place called Saratoga, where eventually the Americans they would fight this kind of back and forth battle with them. And eventually the Americans would charge. They would charge the British at Saratoga, break their line in the center. They actually go on offense for once, win a battle, and surround Burgoyne's army and destroy it. 100% of Burgoyne's army is either killed, wounded, or captured. The Indian allies, they, you know, white guy doesn't know what he's doing, and they run off, okay, for the most part. But everybody else, Burgoyne's army is removed from the map. It doesn't exist anymore. One day, Burgoyne and the British had an army in upstate New York. After the Battle of Saratoga, they don't. It, it's gone. So this is a tremendous, tremendous blow for the Americans and against the British. Okay, so when you look at the fallout from Saratoga, Saratoga is one of the great sort of turning points uh, in the war for independence. Okay, when you look at the morale effect uh, on both the Americans and the British, you'll see that what you would expect with the Americans is what happens. The Americans are related. Okay, you have an unqualified. You know, no asterisk needed, you know, kind of victory for the United States. The Americans are, we can win. We take on the British, we beat them, okay? Recruitment picks up all throughout the 13 states, the American Army. Because, like I said, nobody wants to be on a losing team. But also, you see a lot of people, well, if we're going to win, I want to be on the winning team. I don't want to sort of sit at home and say, well, where were you during when we were kicking the crap out of the British? You know, well, I was at home, you know, I didn't do anything. You don't want to be that guy, right? So you're going to see recruitment is going to pick up all over the place. So now we're going to have more men uh, in the ranks. The British are absolutely shocked at this. Okay, I mean it's one thing to lose a battle. You, know, you attack some Americans in some fort. You don't take it. And you kind of lick your wounds and you figure out a different way to attack them, right? Or you know you got a bunch of drunk German mercenaries that get captured, you know, on Christmas Eve, on Christmas night. Eh, it's not a big deal. British army, British commander, the Americans attack it. They surround it. They capture them all. What? You know, that, that does not make sense. The government of Lord North, who is the prime minister at this point, is badly shaken. Okay? He doesn't lose the prime ministership, but you're going to see that shockwaves reverberate pretty badly throughout his government. And his government, the government of the Tory party, are the ones that are really pushing for, hey, we need to not allow the Americans to have independence. This will send a signal to the rest of the empire that they'll all think that they can be independent. Uh, you'll see that the Whig party that is the, the, the party that is uh, strong but out of power is basically saying, hey, look, if the Americans want to declare independent, let them. <laughs> you know, this war is expensive, it's bloody. After they have their own country, we can still trade with them. We trade with other countries, it's not a big deal. So, Lord North, Lord North's position, uh, his government is really, it takes it's kind of a blow politically because of the bad situation uh, on the battlefield. But 
We're also, if you're going to look at it from the position of a, a military general, you look at the military situation, we had an army and now we don't. There are all these troops that are, that are removed from the equation. So we've talked about the effect that it has in America, the effect that it has in Britain. But one of the things we really haven't talked a lot is what about places around the world that aren't either one of these two? That they're not America, they're not uh, Britain. Most importantly of all, we're going to see that a lot of the eyes that have been watching this struggle between these American colonists and the British Empire are people that are not very friendly to Britain, especially people that Britain had recently beaten in a series of wars. And one of the things they really, you know, they're kind of rooting for is, you know, I really like to see these sort of pitchfork-wielding rubes, you know, kind of stick it to the British Empire. Ha, <laughs> that'd be great, okay? You guys want to get involved and help us? No! <laughs> you guys are a bunch of idiots, you're going to lose, okay? Saratoga convinced France especially, and a lot of other European nations, that these guys may go ahead and win. The thing that we want to have happen, these guys may be able to do it. Just a little help. Just a little help is all they're going to need in order to be able to do this. And so we're going to see that France and Spain and some other places, they are now going to get involved directly, and they are going to declare war uh, on England. All right? What's going to take, what's going to happen here is, uh, the Enlightenment really is already in action here in America. Um, it's not something that Americans sort of just sit around and talk about. Hey, wouldn't it be great if we had a government that was, you know, required to be responsive to what the people want, what they want, you know, really do? And is reason and debate should dominate rather than just who's related to whom and, you know, what kings arbitrarily want to do? Yeah, that'd be great. That's what they're doing in Europe. In America, they were actually trying. Hey, you know, we're independent now. You go away. Why? We have rights and liberties. You trample them. We're going to vote for our own government. So a lot of the enlightened, sort of liberty-minded Europeans had been pulling for America from the start, okay, because of what they represented. A few of them had already made their way across the Atlantic, and they were helping out the Americans uh, succeed in their uh, endeavor in a direct kind of um, fashion. Because they really, they saw this struggle as one of freedom and, you know, sort of liberty, democracy versus monarchy. All right. <clears throat> so they're going to volunteer uh, in pretty sizable numbers. But after Saratoga, and after especially their home governments declare war on England, helping the Americans is no longer kind of a volunteer activity that you're interested in. In many cases now, it's a matter of national policy. So French soldiers can now come over and help the Americans do this, regardless of what their political beliefs are, because that's the policy of their government. I should be fighting against the British because we're, we're at war with them. Okay? And we're trying to help the Americans... Uh, win their independence. So Saratoga is a real game changer in that this trickle of sort of liberal Europeans coming over to help the Americans is now going to turn into a flood. That there are large numbers of these people can come over uh, and help them out. I got a couple of examples, and I don't want you to just think that they're the only sort of um, two that were involved. But this gives you an idea of kind of who some of these people are, what they're doing, and why they're doing this. Uh, the Marquis de Lafayette, right? Or as we would pronounce it around here, Lafayette, right? Uh, there's a reason that basically I think every state in the, the Union has a Lafayette or Lafayette County. Uh, and that is he's a really important uh, figure in American history. He was recently, in uh, the last 10, 20 years or so, he was granted uh, citizenship by Congress, posthumously, obviously. Uh, he was Frenchman, and he was a member, as you can tell from his uh, title, the Marquis de la Lafayette, right? Um, he was of the nobility, but he was one of these enlightened, sort of liberal-minded Europeans and he saw this struggle in America as one that he wanted to back for his own personal reasons. He was an aide to General Washington. He was a friend, really, through the, for the rest of his life with Thomas Jefferson. They corresponded on political and social issues. Uh, he helped lead forces in battle because he had military experience from the French Army. He provided some financial support to the military. Uh, if you see the Mel Gibson film The Patriot, the French officer that's in that that's come over to help the Americans, uh, he is patterned after Lafayette. So that, that's who he is. So this is a guy that worked really his tail off to help the Americans on, on every level to uh, win their independence militarily from uh, the British. Friedrich von Steuben, who was a Prussian, he was a German, okay, and he's a drill master. He comes over, he volunteers his services in really a rather crucial area uh, that the American army needed help with, which was, okay, how do we march? You know, how do we fight? How do we change formations? Because we really suck at that. How do we fire volley, you know, all at one time? And so Von Steuben is going to come over, and he's going to volunteer his services to General Washington, who's going to put him in charge of drill. 
you know, take these guys through uh, their military maneuvers so that they know what they're doing. And this is going to help the Americans improve as soldiers throughout the war. And so eventually, really by the end, they can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with British, and at least the Continentals, the guys that were regular army, they can do just as well as anybody else, okay? Well, we were the, oh, sat up Saratoga, yeah, we win the, win the battle, we win the war, everything's looking up. Well, not really. I mean, there's still a lot of problems that uh, General Washington still has to face. So, in spite of the fact that there is a big victory in upstate New York, Washington's army faces big problems. Remember, Washington and his army that's operating here in Pennsylvania is not at Saratoga. They don't, they don't get the rush of victory. They've got to read about it in the newspapers, the same as everybody else that wasn't there. So, what is his army? What is the main, main Continental Army? What are they doing? They're in defensive positions outside of Philadelphia. How and his army is in Philadelphia, they're kind of holed up there. And Washington has to put his army sort of in positions to make sure that they then don't march out into the countryside and go on a rampage. He's got to, he's got to watch these guys uh, to do this. But what that means is while Howe and his men are sort of in, they got nice and warm, you know, houses to sleep in, and they got the little taverns that they can go to. Howe, of course, he has a warm place to stay himself. Uh, Washington and his men are in Valley Forge, the countryside, outside uh, of Philadelphia, in a bitterly cold winter of 1776 and 1777. Uh, the real success here, Valley Forge is one of the great sort of moments in the history of the Continental Army. There's no battle that's fought. There's no sort of big bloody engagement where Washington really wallops the British. The battle is sort of a spiritual one. How do you keep this army together despite the fact that they don't have enough food, they don't have enough clothing, they don't have enough shoes, they don't have enough blankets, they're huddling together uh, in the snow. Some of these guys are gonna, a lot of these guys are gonna die. How do you keep these guys together? All right? Washington stayed with his men. All right? He stayed directly with them. A lot of times when, when armies would go into winter quarters, uh, the commanding generals, they'll sort of take houses with wealthy civilians that in many cases are miles and miles away. Washington would generally stay near where his men were. Okay? He rode amongst them. Uh, occasionally he would get down from his horse. He would put just common soldiers up on his horse if they were, if they were tired. Uh, he shared his food with hungry soldiers. In many cases, uh, we have letters from Washington writing home to his wife who's knitting him socks. Send more socks because I'm going to give a bunch of mine to the soldiers. Because many of them, they don't, they don't have anything. They're barefoot in the snow. So this was a guy that, that showed just constant care and concern, coaching up his guys. Listen, we've got to stay together. This is important. This is what we've got to do. He is going to lose 2,000 men to the cold at Valley Forge. 2,000 guys are going to die. Frostbite, exposure, hypothermia. This is, this is a rough way to go. Okay, but The army that marches out of Valley Forge in the spring of 1777 is stronger than the one that marched into it because it had really it had united around uh, its leader around George Washington. So we got to look here for a second. Who is this guy? Who is this guy that, that Franklin referred to as the indispensable man? All right, and we want to pull away some of the mythology, you know, and get to, get to kind of the character of what this guy was going um, was going on because he basically creates a mythology, one that is very effective around himself because it's it's that, that these guys are fighting for. Okay, Washington was tall. He was taller than most everybody else in the colonies at this point. He was a big dude. He was like six foot three uh, at this point. Uh, he was an extremely sort of pious kind of Christian. He wasn't real vociferous. You'll, you'll hear some of the, if you read some of the, uh, the diary entries, letters and things like that, they say he's really not an outlandish kind of over the top, you know, hallelujah kind of Christian. Um, some of them make the mistake of saying he was kind of just sort of had a vague understanding about God. But I mean, to him, Christianity was important. He was pious about it. Uh, he was often seen sort of praying amongst his men. Uh, but he was also a strict disciplinarian. Uh, it would be wrong to sort of think that Washington was real buddy-buddy with his men. Guys that got out of line, they got punished. And if you read about punishments in armies uh, really anywhere in the world in the 1770s, some of them were kind of strict. Uh, you didn't just have to sort of stand extra guard duty. Sometimes guys got hung up by ropes with their thumbs. Uh, some of them, you know, got some you know, whippings. And if you tried to desert or get other people to desert, you were shot. So... He was a strict disciplinarian, but that kind of thing works in armies. Armies have to have discipline because you look at armies that don't and they, they fall apart very quickly. Washington also had one of those sort of magnetic personalities. Um, you read some of, these, uh, some of these accounts, and when Washington would walk into a room, if you've ever met somebody that kind of just, everybody just kind of gravitates to 
towards them for whatever reason. Washington was one of these people. He just had that kind of personality that made people want to listen to him, that helped convince people that whatever he was saying was right. It's not something that is quantifiable. It's just something that happens. Uh, Washington, because he was, he was a kind of a tight-lipped, reserved kind of guy. He was not the kind of guy that you would sort of sit down with and, and yuck it up, you know, and sort of be you know, pals with. He was not that kind of personality. Uh, he was he was kind and he was a, sort of an open kind of figure, but he was not very jovial. He was not a garrulous you know kind of guy. Um, and so some people sort of mistook his quietness for the fact that well he must not be very bright. I mean he, he's he's got a lot of common sense, but he's not overly educated. But if you read any of his writings or any of his papers, if you've been to his house and you've seen his library, uh, he was extremely intelligent on a number of subjects. Not not just uh, sort of military and government, but also diplomacy, geography, uh, soil chemistry. Uh, he was incredibly interested in a number of fields. So he had a very powerful, educated uh, mind. Now, he is counted among the great sort of military leaders of American uh, history, but he's not really much of a battle winner. Uh, in fact, most of the battles that he's going to fight in, he's going to lose. Uh, now, for the most part, it's not, you don't look back on him and go, well, Washington got out general. You know, he made a mistake, or he played right into somebody's traps. Uh, that, that'll happen from time to time, where Washington, you know, is not a perfect general. Uh, but generally speaking, most of the battles he's going to lose is because his troops break. Uh, he's got inferior troops. They're not well matched. Uh, he's outnumbered. They don't have the supplies that they need. Uh, and so his real success, though, is keeping his army together. All right? He rallied them always. He kept them from going home either in Pennsylvania or in New Jersey or various other places. So his greatest victory was not stomping the British. He would eventually get around to doing that. All right? But his greatest victory was keeping these guys from going home and giving up, keeping them together. He shared the dangers and misfortunes uh, of his soldiers whenever possible. He was not one of those kind of generals who sort of led from the rear. Uh, this was a, very much the consternation uh, of his staff. He would sometimes come back from battles with uh, horses that had been shot, holes through his uniform, so uh, this is, this is a, he's a, he led a dangerous sort of life. The effect of that, though, on his men is he's going to share our dangers. He's not going to be this kind of guy that leaves from a distance. Uh, he's going to be in amongst us, no matter whether he's getting shot at or whether we're being snowed on, sort of up to our navels. So he was, a, he was a pretty tough guy in this. And as a result of that, he is absolutely loved by his men. He gets to the point where sort of late in the war, at one point the French, when they begin to arrive, uh, in Rhode Island, they send to Washington, who's operating in New York, and they say, hey, you need to come over here and meet with us. And he basically says, no, I can't, I can't leave my army, because if I leave them, they may just go home. <laughs> that I'm kind of the glue that's holding the whole thing together, and if they get word that I've left, then that's it. They're going to quit. So uh, he would be loved by his men. If you go to Washington's tomb today on his plantation in Northern Virginia, uh, it doesn't say... President Washington. It doesn't say General and President Washington. It just says General Washington. That was the epithet that he really felt the most uh, pride in, the one that he really felt the greatest service that he did to the nation was not as its first chief executive, although that is a huge, we're going to see that there's a lot of stuff that George Washington does for the United States other than just being a revolutionary general. But that was, that was his number one job that he felt that he did for the United States was he served as its uh, commander-in-chief of its military during the time that it, that it had to give birth to itself. Well, on the military front, as we've seen, things have really haven't quite gone um, the way that the British thought they were going to go. Uh, they kind of got shooed out of New England. They captured New York City, and they sort of pushed George Washington around out of New Jersey, but Washington kind of fights back. They capture the capital, and well, that should be it. You know, we captured most of their major port cities. Uh, by this point, you know, they captured Savannah, Georgia, and Charleston. South Carolina, uh, you know, no country can survive without its ports, without its major cities, without its capital. Uh, why have these guys surrendered? <laughs> They're still fighting. They're still out there. Washington has given us problems. In fact, Washington, uh, the, uh, Howe would eventually abandon Philadelphia and move the war effort back to New York City, uh, where you get kind of a World War I kind of situation, where Washington's dug in outside the city, uh, Howe's army is dug in right at the edge of the city, and you've got kind of a no man's land uh, in between them. So the British high command is, they're looking at this, why haven't we won? <laughs> How come the Americans are still fighting? And, okay, well, you know, where have we not fought a lot so far? We fought a lot in New England, we really kind of got thumped there, those guys were crazy. Uh, the Mid-Atlantic states really didn't go our way quite yet as well, we've had to pacify those people. We haven't fought a lot in the South. So, the thinking was, 
that there were a lot of loyalists in the South. You had a lot of plantations. You had a lot of the sort of the genteel Americans that were down there that were these big sort of wealthy plantation owners. They're probably loyalists. <laughs> They're not. Not a lot of them anyway. Um, and so, but that was the idea is we'll send an army down there to kind of put down the rebellion in the southern colonies, right, in the southern states, and then we'll be able to turn our forces north and we'll be able to hit Washington's army from uh, behind. So you'll see that the new British commander in that sector, uh, Lord Cornwallis, is going to be sent in to uh, accomplish this task. And so once, once he gets his army, uh, his, his new army to be brought in and sort of beefed up, and they'll be able to go through uh, the Carolinas and then on into Virginia, and then eventually uh, sweep up through the Mid-Atlantic so we'll end the rebellion kind of from behind. Okay? Things go pretty well for the British they, they, uh, as, as they get started. They take Charlestown, which we, you and I refer to as Charleston now, and then they begin to uh, move uh, through the Carolinas, uh, moving towards North Carolina. They would eventually uh, meet in a sort of major uh, battle at a place called Camden, South Carolina, and they would just rip the American army apart. The militia would break and run in the middle of the fighting. There would be a big gap in the line. Cornwallis knew exactly how to exploit this kind of thing. Just really knocked the tar uh, out of the American army uh, at Camden and in a few other places that they, that they decided to come out and fight. So it looks like the way is pretty clear for British Army advancement from South Carolina into North Carolina. But as we've seen here, the Americans are a little more crafty okay, than this. And we'll see that just because the American Army has kind of scattered, at least momentarily, that doesn't mean that they're gone, and it doesn't mean that they've given up. American militia under the command of a guy named Francis Marion, who had earned the nickname the Swamp Fox, engaged in what is basically a guerrilla campaign uh, of attacking the British Army's supply lines. Their little reinforcements intercepting their uh, military communications, destroying their food sources, okay? And they would sort of, you know, come out of these swamps, right? Uh, and uh, these cotton fields, and, you know, they hide in the forests and things like that. And they would attack small detachments uh, of the British Army. Now, again, this is another one of those instances where you got kind of the British are being attacked by the American militia and hiding behind rocks and trees and things like that. You're not going to win the war doing this. They're not going to destroy Cornwallis' army. By, uh, by these kinds of tactics. They are going to slow them down, though. And this is exactly what takes place. And this keeps them from moving to the north. They can't, they can't move without supplies. Okay? If you don't believe me, just try to move around and do your job several days without eating. It is, eventually, you're going to stop. And that's exactly what happens with these armies. Okay? So Francis Marion uh, and a few others, you know, Light Horse Harry Lee and some other guys, uh, are going to be playing havoc on Cornwallis' uh, lines of supply. Okay? He does briefly kind of make it into North Carolina, but eventually he's drawn back into fighting uh, in South Carolina. The major American commander sent to this district now is a guy named Daniel Morgan. Okay? And Daniel Morgan gets his army kind of re-put uh, back together again, uh, and they decide to offer battle at a place called Cowpens, South Carolina. You've got to love American names. We name a place Cowpens, right? Because they pinned up a lot of cows there, right? So it's pretty straightforward. Now, <clears throat> as they... Uh, as they look at the situation, uh, Morgan understands that about a third of his army are these militia guys. And uh, if you've seen the, the final battle in the movie The Patriot, it's the Battle of Cowpens that just did it slightly differently uh, than um, what happened in the, in the real fighting. Uh, but basically, it's the Battle of Cowpens. And Morgan uh, rationalizes that, okay, you know, our militia runs away. And we, we've sort of come to expect that. But the British have come to expect that as well. And we can use that maybe to sucker these guys into a trap. And so what it does is he picks a position that's in a pretty heavily wooded area with the, uh, two hills, one directly in front of and behind the other. And the, puts, he puts the militia uh, on the first hill. And what he does is he goes up to these guys and he says, okay, this is what, this is what I want you guys to do. The British are going to march up, and I want you to open fire on the British, and I want you to stand there uh, and, and shoot at the British. Well, you know they're going to shoot back, boss, <laughs> you know. Uh, and so he basically says, yeah, listen, I know you guys, you know, you're not professional soldiers, and you're just, you know, militia guys, you're just farmers or whatever. All you got to do is fire two shots. The British are going to march up, you're going to fire at them, and they're, they're going to shoot at you. But then you, I need you to reload, fire into them one more time, and then you guys, are, you're done. You guys can go home after that. So what he did was he kind of challenged their manhood. 
Yeah, and I don't immediately run away, you know, like a bunch of sissies. Stand there. I don't want, I'm not going to ask you to all get slaughtered, but I want you to stand there. I want you to fire at a couple of times. Okay, and then you can run away. Just, just retreat back over the hill towards the main line, which they had on the second hill. Well, they do this. They form up on the brow of the first hill. The British Army, they march up, the Americans fire into them. British fire at these guys while they're reloading, and they fire one more time. They knock down a few of them, and then they retreat. They retreat over the hill, back into the little valley, and then back behind the other hill. Well, the British, well, that's it, we've won. Time to go into pursuit mode, all right? In which case, of course, they they break their ranks, and they're trying to run after these guys, and of course, trying to keep their ranks sort of straightened out in the trees is very, very difficult. But then they run into the main line of American forces that are formed up on the next hill. They're extremely badly organized. The Americans now begin to pour musket fire down onto them. And as the British are trying to get reorganized, of course, they're getting shot at, the guys are going down, they're having trouble getting organized in the trees, and they're basically starting to get shot at uh, in a lot of ways. The American cavalry comes in from the left flank, and they hit these guys just at the point where they're disorganized. Okay? They throw these guys into even more chaos, and watching all this, kind of from the back a little bit, is the American militia. Hey, look, they got the Brits covered on like two sides. Looks like we may win. Well, nobody wants to miss a good ass with it, okay? And so the American militia actually reforms itself. They, they were done for the day, and they come in and they close in one of the other sides of the British army because at this point, now it's just, it's just a turkey shoot. The British are not organized in lines and sort of firing back at you in sheets of flame. They're just, they're just kind of in there in a pot. And these guys are American. They're just amongst the rocks and the trees. They don't need a lot of organization. They don't need a lot of command and control. Just open fire. Just shoot at them. Just kill as many of them as you can. Okay? And so when these, uh, the train continentals, they launch this counterattack, just as the British are kind of at their, their most chaotic. Uh, they win. They win at Cowpens, and they destroy most of the British force uh, there. The, uh, the British colonel who was in charge of the British Army here at the Battle of Cowpens is a guy named Tarleton. Tarleton was a real big buttwad in oral history. He was one of the ones that uh, he would hang American, you know, people that he suspected of being uh, you know, patriots rather than loyalists. He would confiscate their property, he'd burn down farms. He was generally pretty well uh, hated. When American soldiers would try to surrender if they were captured in battle, uh, he would cut them down. He would just kill them. You know, you don't allow them to surrender, you just kill them. And so when his guys were trying to surrender here at the Battle of Cowpens, uh, they would ask for what's called quarter, which is basically I surrender. Um, and when the American cavalry rode amongst them, they said Tarleton's quarter, meaning you know, we're going to treat you the same way Tarleton treated our guys, and they refused to let most of these British guys uh, surrender. So the Battle of Cowpens uh, is an unqualified American victory. Okay, it's not the main kind of battle. All right, it's a good sort of test case for what's going to take place here. Uh, so Cornwallis now moves into the area with his main army and. Uh, Daniel Morgan uh, gets some more forces, and he decides, hey, if it worked once at uh, Cowpens, then maybe it'll work again. And they meet at a place in southern North Carolina called Guilford Courthouse. Okay? Uh, now, Cornwallis is a little bit better general than uh, Tarleton is, and his force is a little bit larger. And also, they've kind of seen the trick before, all right? but it is still largely successful of having the American sort of militia sort of fire at these guys and then retreat to a designated position where you've got the American sort of main line of resistance and then that causes a significant amount of disarray in uh, the British ranks, all right? So at Guilford Courthouse, it's pretty successful, but the British, they've seen, they've kind of seen the magic show already, all right? And so the British wind up winning at Guilford Courthouse. They drive the Americans off, but they don't shatter the army like they did at Camden. They don't, you know, sort of, send the American army in disarray into the woods, and they're never going to be able. They, they win after a hard fight. The Americans, they retreat. They retreat from the battlefield, but they're not broken. More importantly, the British suffer such an extremely high casualty rate at Guilford Courthouse that they begin to look at themselves and say, you know, if we win too many more battles like this one, we're not going to have an army anymore. <laughs> we can't afford to lose soldiers at this kind of rate. And Cornwallis, after the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, realizes, all right, the Carolinas are full of crazy people. All right? These guys here in the Carolinas are nuts. They're not, it's not full of loyalists. It's full of crazy people like uh, Lee and like Marion and uh, you know, Morgan. And they're going to fight me to the nail. So I need to go establish a different base. And I'm going to move my army by water to Virginia. There's a little diagram if you want to see uh, of what 
the, the battle here at Calpins look like here, the, the sort of the first hill with the militia, and the next day we retreat back here, and then the main fighting is going to take place in this little valley, and just as they hold them up, U.S. cavalry comes in on this side, the militia is going to reorganize and hit these guys on this side. For those of you who have only a rudimentary understanding of military uh, tactics, when you're surrounded on three sides and you're getting shot at and you're disorganized, you're probably going to lose. And that's exactly what happens uh, at Calpins. Right? This leads us up to the campaign that's eventually going to culminate in the battle, of the siege and then battle, uh, of Yorktown. So Cornwallis uh, moves his army via water to the James River Peninsula in eastern uh, Virginia. For those of you who live in Florida, you're familiar with what a peninsula is. It is a spit of land that is surrounded on three sides by water. Now this seems to be a pretty safe place for Cornwallis to at least start his military campaign.